Well, hey everybody, I'm Patrick. Um, I'm with Native. We are a, um, a company based in San Francisco. We went through Y Combinator about a year and a half ago, and we work with a lot of brands and publishers and help them optimize their content for more revenue on social. And the way that we do that is by helping them test their messaging. Um, and so today I'm going to talk with you about testing your messaging from a Facebook page um, using what's known as a dark test. Um, and so I'm going to go through uh, what exactly dark testing is, uh, why people are doing it, um, kind of demystify some of the things around it um, that make it seem a little scary or intimidating to get started with, um, and then also uh, share some recommendations for how you guys can get started um, very quickly, even if you only have like a half hour of time. Um, so first, what exactly is dark testing? Um, it's uh, a approach of using um, what's called unpublished page posts on Facebook to A-B test different headlines and images um, against different target audiences that you care about. Um, and those may be target audiences uh, like people who are uh, people who are similar to your existing page fans, people who are visiting uh, your website, maybe people who are visiting your pricing page. Um, there's a lot of really creative things you can do with target audiences. Um, and the reason folks are doing it is because they get more sales by testing their messaging, by getting their message right every time. Um, you can e easily also go in and do um, minimum viable concept testing. So if you're flirting with a new idea, you want to go in and you want to test it out quickly to see if it's getting any traction and it makes sense to pursue an, a minimum viable product for it. Um, this is an easy way to go out and play with some of those things. Um, and there's a lot of other reasons that I'll get into um, in a little bit. Um, in the past, this technique has been primarily used by really large brands and publishers. Um, it was kind of reserved to the elite of social teams. Um, it doesn't have to be. It's actually pretty easy to do once you understand uh, how to do it. Um, and so that's what we're going to try and go through today as well. Um, so there's a few pieces to uh, dark tests. There are the, the vehicle, which as I mentioned is the Facebook unpublished page post. Um, and then you have a target audience and you have creatives, so um, headlines and, and images and descriptions. Uh, so first, the unpublished page post, um, this doesn't actually go out to your page fans. So it shows up as a sponsored post in somebody's newsfeed on Facebook when they hit you know, when they first log into Facebook. But if they went to your Facebook page, they would not see it in your feed. Um, so this is a way of you know, easily playing with things without it actually being seen by all of your fans. And that's the idea, is that you get to test before you post to your fans. Um, it's only shown to your target audience, which excludes your fans. Um, the lookalike audience is kind of the default way to target folks. And that's based off a group of people who resemble um, the audience you care about, and as I mentioned, it could be like your existing page fans. Um, it is created based off an algorithm that Facebook has that targets folks based on their behavior and their demographics and a, a variety of factors. But it's you know if you were to go in and take a sample size of you know a sample of your your population of um, uh, page fans, site visitors, whatever it may be, they have common characteristics, and that's what Facebook builds these audiences around. So you have got the vehicle, which is the post. You've got the audience that you're targeting. And then you have your creatives. Um, and so when you're going in and you are um, you know, you're playing with a bunch of different images and a bunch of different headlines, uh, folks will sometimes go only, you know, only think, oh, that it's the headline that matters. Headlines are huge. But at the end of the day, the image is the first thing that people are going to see when it shows up in their newsfeed. So it's best to make sure you have some decent images to work with first. And then you can play with the headlines and messaging that goes along with it. Um, there can be very, very significant differences in performance. You'll see, um, so this is two sets of text and, and three images. Um, so this could be a, a total of six different combinations of messages. Those six combinations could have enormously different click-through rates. Um, and cost of engaging people. And you could also see really, really large shifts in terms of which audiences even resonate with those different messages. So maybe you don't have many page fans. Um, we certainly didn't when we first started dark testing. So we were looking at segments of people who were hitting our website. 
because even if you have a few hundred people hitting your website, you now have enough to start building and testing and looking at those different groups. Um, so you do see very, very significant differences across this audience as well as the messages. So altogether, you have, again, the unpublished post. You're testing the different messages. It's going out to people who look like your page fans. And once you identify the best message, you can post to your page fans knowing that you're using the best one. So you get more engagement from them. The process of testing also gets you more you know, page likes, post engagement, so likes, comments, and shares to the post, as well as traffic to your site. So if you're also trying to get some social proof up front for something, and you have share counts, for example, you can kind of front load it by doing this testing up front before anybody else even sees it. Um, So going back to people not always doing this sort of technique. There's, there's always some internal hurdle. They don't have time. They don't have whatever. Um, maybe they don't have the resources they want to allocate. It is very, very easy to get this up and going. And I'll run through a few examples of how people have benefited from it in a minute. But kind of the, there are five reasons why you'd even bother doing this sort of testing. Um, one, you want more sales from social. Um, it's as simple as that. If you think that your best message is going to help you get more sales, like that's, that's kind of an easy, easy win for getting more from social. Um, if you don't have any sales from social at all, this is the easiest way to get started to try and drive sales from there. Um, also, if you're trying to build a brand, build a community, and you want more engagement from your fans, this is also an easy way. Once you're posting messages that are engaging more folks who are interested, you can get more of their friends involved and start building a group around that. Um, a lot of this, too, is just uh, a, you know, a team learning experience. What types of messaging, what value propositions are resonating with, with folks? Um, there's probably like five different ways you can explain what you're doing, whether you are um, you know, B2C or B2B. And it's always a game. You know, for, for us, it's always on sales calls. We're always experimenting with the way to frame it. But you can hit a lot of those folks on, on social, too. Um, as I mentioned with the audience testing, Maybe your page fans just aren't engaging with your stuff at all, and there's another audience out there that would. So going in and taking your set of creatives and, and trying them against a handful of different audiences um, is an easy way to figure out, like, oh, wow, like, you know, uh, I'm doing really, really well with this particular segment of the, the population. I did not realize that this was going to resonate with them so much. And that way you can refine your tactics and your overall strategy. Um, and as I mentioned, you can also go in and, and quickly test a minimum viable concept before going in and investing more in an MVP. So like, you stand up a landing page in two hours that describes whatever your value prop is and have like some basic conversion. Little currency can just be put your email in. Get some sort of currency set up there. Run one of these tests. You'll be driving people to share and click back to your site. And if you see some traction and it makes sense to refine further and, and do more, you can. Um, but at a minimum, you want to fail fast. And you, know, you can start learning those things very quickly. In terms of the results you'll see, uh, it's used, you know, dark testing is used by a wide variety of folks. From, again, publishers to small brands to large brands, um, B2B, B2C. Uh, in this case, you know, Viral Nova is, is a, I guess, a fairly well-known publisher that kind of came out of nowhere in the last few years. Um, and, and their claim to fame was that you know, they used uh, message testing on Facebook as a key way um, to, to drive a lot of their growth, um, even with just a couple of people on their team. Um, you know, Wishpond, which focuses on, on lead gen, um, they were able to get an 80% improvement um, and, and their click-through rate. You've got John Loomer, who I highly recommend you all check out. He has a lot of great tips um, on, on ways you can refine your, your marketing strategy on social, um, independent of dark tests. But he was getting a 35x ROI. Um, and then lastly, Facebook's own example. Um, they, they gave an example of somebody who drove a 30x ROI on ad spend when they're trying to drive more ticket sales. So ticket sales is actually a, a really popular one. People drive, you know, trying to drive more, more product sales and ticket sales. Um, but at the end of the day, if you buy into the idea that getting your message right is valuable for you as a brand, then you should be testing. Um, and I, I do think that dark testing is the easiest one to get up and going. So this is where 
with this testing, with very limited amount of time and budget, you can outperform the Don Drapers of the world. There are people out there who are marketing geniuses. Um, I like to think that everybody in the room probably is, is eager and hungry to learn as quickly as possible. Um, and this is the way to catch up and outperform those folks who aren't doing testing. Um, now going to the misconception that testing is hard, people will, will kind of bite off more than they can chew. They'll say, well, I want to test emails. I want to test my website. I want to test all the things. Um, that's good to have ambitions to test all the things. But um, it's hard to get your team bought in to expanding testing over time across multiple channels unless you're able to get some, some good wins in and, and, and some good learnings in. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how you can do the dark testing. Um, so there's two options. You can do it manually or programmatically. Um, we're going to talk about manually today through Facebook's Power Editor, um, which is, uh, you know, up until now, primarily how everybody's been doing it. So either Power Editor or Business Manager, which then leads you back to Power Editor. Um, so there are kind of eight overall steps to do it. Um, and I'll be sharing this, this deck around uh, with Tammy and, and the team later on so you guys can go back and click these links. Uh, these links lead back to um, some additional Facebook um, uh, recommendations. But, um, and so I'm not going to run through all these right now, but it's, it's pretty quick. You're just going in and you're creating an ad campaign. You need to have an active ad account with Facebook to do it. Um, you're going to create an audience, um, which uh, I recommend starting with a lookalike audience. That's the easiest one to get started with. Um, you're going to create an ad set. So, so the structure for Facebook is you've got an ad campaign, and then within it, you'll have multiple ad sets. And then within those ad sets, you'll have multiple ads. Um, I recommend having a single ad set um, for a single dark test. Some people do something a little different than that. I'll run through that later. Um, but that is the, the most efficient way to, to get results um, quickly. Um, in terms of the number of messages to test, people go in and say, well, I've got this one and I've got this one. I want to do just one and two. I don't recommend just doing one or two. If you're going to spend the time um, testing, make sure you get some additional ones in there. Um, I usually recommend doing somewhere between 9 and 16. Um, the more that you're able to do within that, that range, the more likely they'll see a lift in performance. Um, the idea is not to just throw in kind of willy-nilly like a bunch of different images and headlines. Like pick things that are your best guess, um, things that you think have a good chance of resonating. Um, and it's always good to throw a wild card in there too, because sometimes you'll be surprised. Um, when you're picking where you want to target folks, focus the placement on mobile and desktop. Facebook, uh, for the most part, prioritizes everything on mobile. So um, even if you pick desktop, it probably will only run about 1% of, of the impressions through desktop. Everything else will go through mobile. Um, you will set your conversion goal. And for this, it's, you know, you're going to pick website clicks as your conversion goal. And that's like a, a good catch-all for um, engagement for your post, for driving more sales. Um, there's other fancier things you can do, but that's a good catch-all that, that works for 90% of the time. Um, you'll submit your ads off for review. The only reason Facebook typically rejects it, assuming you're not using any sort of, like, um, I guess, offensive images or anything like that, they may reject it because you put in too much text in your image. If text represents more than 20% of your image, they will reject it. If you put in a bunch of big Facebook logos or suggest that Facebook is endorsing your product in any way, they will also reject that. Those are the two most common. There's like 200 additional reasons they may, but um, just keep an eye out for those two. The test will go in. It'll run for however long you set it to run. I recommend about 24 hours. Um, you'll see the messages jockey around for the first um, you know, half of the test or so, but you'll have a clear winner that stands out. Um, in terms of the, the metrics that are most important to pay attention to for which one's best, um, I'll go through those in a minute. Um, but before I do that, um, I want to talk about the audience creation process. Audience creation is, is um, usually one of the biggest stumbling blocks for people. They just don't know where to start with an audience. Um, there are three types. 
there's a lookalike, there's a custom, and there's a saved. Um, so a saved is a saved audience is one where you're you're saying, oh, I want to target people who are specifically women between the ages of um, you know 29 and 36 in the LA area, and they have all these other characteristics. So you can do that if you want. Um, that's hyper specific for this type of testing. Using a custom audience is usually the best place to start out. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, a custom audience and a, and a lookalike audience. Custom audiences are what you use if you want to target people who are visiting something on your site. You have an email lead list that you want to upload and build it off of that. Um, but I recommend using the lookalike based off your existing page fans just to get started very quickly. Um, so what you do is you're just going to go into Power Editor, you're going to go to Audiences, you're going to pick Create Audience, and you're going to say Lookalike. Um, you're going to set the source to your Facebook page. You need an active Facebook page that has at least 100 page fans. Um, if you don't have 100 page fans, I will recommend an alternate type that you can use based off your site traffic instead. That requires you to put in the Facebook pixel. Um, but let's assume that you have 100 page fans or more. Um, you'll set the, the target size for the lookalike to 9.6 million, which is maximized for reach. Um, that assumes that your target country is the US. Um, so it ranges from 1.9 million to 19.6 million in the little range indicator you'll see. This is right in the middle. Um, so it's a good balance of, of kind of reach and specificity. Um, in terms of that alternate approach I mentioned, if you don't have a lot of page fans, or maybe you do have page fans, but they're not high quality. Um, some of you all will know what I'm talking about, where you know, maybe you played around and you bought 100 page fans um, for you know, a dollar from some unknown site. If those aren't particularly good quality fans, uh, you probably want to run off your site, because you know the site traffic is probably going to be much higher quality. Um, so what you'll do. <coughs> For this particular type, this is a good way to expand your, your top of funnel. Um, so you're going to add the Facebook tracking pixel to your site. When you go into Power Editor, you'll go to Tools and then Tracking Pixels, and it'll give you a code. Plop it in your site. It takes like five minutes, and it's going to start tracking folks on your site, just like you would with Google Analytics or AdRoll or anything like that. Um, as long as you have at least a few hundred unique people flow through that, you'll have a good representation as, as your, your sample, uh, sample size to build this audience off of. Uh, so you'll put the pixel in, you'll come back later that day, or a couple days later, depending on your site traffic. You'll create a uh, lookalike audience based off that custom audience that's tracking folks on your site. Um, I recommend setting it to a very specific um, page on your site. So for example, um, people who are hitting your pricing page or whatever your conversion page. Um, those are the folks who have the highest level of indication of intent. Um, you can even, if you have enough people flowing through your system, let's say you have a community of users, you can even set it up to target folks who have actually logged into your platform um, so they're part of your, your platform or they've even completed a specific action on your platform. You can do that too if you have time. Um, setting your audience size to 1.9 million is the minimum you can do for the lookalike, so that's the maximized version of specificity. Um, so it's going to help you get more conversion when you do reach those folks. Um, the lookalike audience is going to automatically update every three to seven days. So as you have more people join your community, more people hit your pricing page, it's going to automatically update. The more data that comes in, the better the algorithm will work and you'll have more and more specific lookalikes that will help convert better. This particular technique for expanding your top of funnel is a good alternative to, um, uh, there's a lot of other top of funnel expansion services out there. Um, I know that uh, uh, AdRoll, for example, uh, helps with not only retargeting, um, but also with uh, top of funnel solutions. Their top of funnel solutions can work great for you if you're a larger, or larger organization, but if you're running on a limited budget, like this is the easiest way to get up and running and have your own setup. Wanted to give you a quick um, sample design for um, you know, if you're looking to do a, a, a fast turnaround test that has results in 24 hours or something, what should that even look like structurally? 
So we've kind of gone through the different pieces so far of a dark test, how to even get that you know, campaign set up. Um, but let's say you're about to launch a new product, um, or again, you're playing around with a different idea, and you want to figure out very quickly what image headline combo is resonating most and getting the best results. Um, so as I mentioned, suggest nine, nine ads. Um, you want to pick three images. Make sure they're, they're in a good, um, uh, you know, good, good position to be cropped down nicely in, in a landscape mode. Uh, portrait images don't work particularly well for Facebook. Um, so 600 by 315 is, is kind of a good target that you'll kind of whittle it down to. Um, you're going to pick three sets of text. You'll have the custom message at the top of the post, um, which is a little bit more personal and friendly. Then you'll have the headline below the image. You can also put a description below that, but uh, very few people will ever see the description, so I recommend skipping it. Um, and the reason for that is uh, descriptions don't show up on mobile, and Facebook pushes everything on mobile um, for the most part, unless you tell it, don't use mobile at all, only use desktop. If you do want to only push on desktop, you can do that. Performance won't be as good. The test will take longer. Um, but if for some reason you have to run on desktop, um, you have that option. But I recommend letting it do its thing on mobile. Um, you'll go in and you know for the URL, you'll say drive people back to my landing page, for example, um, or conversion page. And for the optimization, the specific name of it is link clicks to website. Um, pay per click. Um, that is Facebook's terminology. They change terminology sometimes. That had a different name two months ago. Um, so you know, as you do this, just you know, you may need to check the Facebook documentation every now and then to figure out what the latest wording is. Um, for a budget, I recommend starting with something between thirty and fifty dollars for the test. You can go lower, um, but if you go lower and you're not getting very good cost per you know CPCs. Um, it's, it's not going to run very well for you. So doing 30 to $50 as a starter test works well. You get to figure out where you are in terms of your cost per click. And then you can knock down the budget for subsequent tests if you're, if you're saying, I'm doing great. I'm getting a $0.05 cent CPC. I can afford to cut down my budget. Um, alternately, if you want a lot of engagement taking place for this piece before it goes live um, to your fans, you can bump it up more and you can set it to $100 or a couple hundred dollars. For runtime. Uh, 24 hours is a, is a good minimum to aim for. You can let it run longer, especially if you're going to do a larger budget, if you want to build up um, this test or visibility among people who are not your, your existing page fans over the course of like a week leading into something. You can set it to run for a week and set a larger budget. Um, <clears throat> you'll usually see preliminary results come in about halfway through the test period, but Facebook's approval process takes roughly 30 minutes to an hour. And on high traffic days where there's a lot of demand for ads, it may take 6 to 12 hours for the test to even begin running. Normally, it should only take a couple hours. But um, just beware, if you aren't seeing impressions come in, um, it's simply because Facebook hasn't decided to start serving it yet, but it will eventually. Um, so if you see that, if you set your time for 24 hours and nothing has served for the first 12, you may want to extend the time by another 12. So you get a full 24 hours. That'll help improve your. Um, your CPCs as well, it gives Facebook more flexibility to optimize the bidding points rather than forcing you to go in in a much less time frame, much shorter time frame where there's less optimal bids available. Um, in terms of the metrics to focus on, there are, um, well, there's a lot. Uh, and it really just depends, what matters depends on what your goal is. So um, the default that everybody thinks about is, you know, how am I doing on my click-through rate, and how am I doing on my cost per click? Uh, Facebook has an additional layer of complexity in that they differentiate between website clicks and clicks. So clicks is the overall bucket of all clicks. Website clicks is specifically people who click the link in the post that drove back to your site. So you can get a click that results from people in the post in the top, -hand corner, top right hand corner it'll have a link back to your Facebook page. So if they click that, that can count as a click. If they go back to your page and they click on something else, that can count as a click. Those aren't website clicks that you were um, you know, specifically focused on. But just think of clicks as the overall bucket, website clicks as the you know, very specific thing you want to target. Um, 
when you're doing this on, on uh, you know, for, for sales conversion, I definitely recommend putting in UTM parameters so that you can see how things are performing. You can pair that with Google Analytics um, pretty easily. So you can start seeing, like, all right, how is this actually converting once people hit my site? You know, what, what's happening with them? Um, so for sales, if you're focusing on trying to drive more sales, you know, look at the website click-through click rate and, and then the conversion, as I mentioned, using the UTM parameters in Google Analytics. Um, if you're looking for fan acquisition, you're trying to grow your Facebook page size. Um, a good metric to look at is the, the number of, of page likes you're getting for all the impressions that are, that are going out. Um, if you're trying to do traffic arbitrage, which some people try and do, where they'll say, all right, I've got this killer piece of content or a set of killer pieces of content. Um, I'm getting really awesome CPCs on it. Like my website click CPCs like a penny. And I'm selling that traffic for the equivalent of three cents on my site. It's just pour money into it. You know, if you're getting a three X return, just pour, pour, pour. So for that, you know, you want to focus on the website click through rate and the uh, website click uh, click through rate. Uh, sorry, CPC. For viral potential, if you are trying to push something really, really far, and, and like that is your goal, just get lots of sharing, tons of visibility, um, there's two metrics that I like to look at. Uh, how many shares are you getting for the impressions coming in? And how many shares are you getting uh, for the likes coming in? Um, if you have uh, like 10, you know, one share for every 10 likes, that's not particularly good. Um, if you have a really high volume of engagement taking place and you're like one share for one click, that's awesome. Like that's, you know, that could be a home run. Um, shares are the key driver of visibility. Likes are nice, but shares are the driver. Um, if you're focused on trying to get more engagement, some more community engagement with your content, um, you want to focus on the aggregate post engagement divided by impressions. And, and even more specifically, shares divided by impressions. So again, these are just a handful of uh, you know, the metrics that I found work best for these types of, of goals. Um, you'll find what works best for you just in the course of, of playing around with things. One thing that, that comes up pretty frequently is this question about, should I force Facebook to test all of my messages evenly. So if I have the nine messages and I'm pouring, let's say, four, you know, $40 in, maybe I want Facebook to put you know, an equal amount of money across all of those messages. Um, that's uh, not really the best way to approach things because one, uh, Facebook will require you to have a minimum of $10 <coughs> of spend per message. So that same test that you could run for $40 is now going to cost you a minimum of $90. Uh, on top of that, um, it can be slower. So it can take longer because um, those different ads are now competing against each other when they exist in different ad sets. So just conceptually, as I mentioned, the typical structure is you've got the campaign, you've got an ad set, and then a bunch of ads in it. And the, the, the best structure to use is one ad set and then those nine ads. But some people say, no, I'm going to have one ad as part of each ad set and break them up individually to force Facebook to run that. Um, so overall, it's a question of do you buy into the idea that Facebook ads are optimized? That's like what they specialize in. It uses machine learning. Um, we're a machine learning shop. We know mathematically it is optimized to outperform nine times out of 10. There are instances where you see some funky things come up. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you can see up here, um, I've got uh, you know, the example of no test. You don't know, you know there's no performance improvements. With the, the multi-ad set test, um, you're, you're, you're not using the optimized approach. So you're putting resources behind lower performing messages for longer, where those resources could be put behind the better performing message that's identified very early on. And so it's a question of, um, and, the, and the way the, the algorithms work is there's is this balance between exploring and exploiting. So, uh, the idea is you do some exploration to figure out you're, you're, you're kind of you know, putting these ads in front of a handful of people for a set, of, you know, set level of impressions. You're learning how the engagement's going, and then you're prioritizing the best performing one more over time. So you're converging on the optimal solution. Um, with uh, a forced A-B test using the multi-ad sets, 
you're saying let's remove entirely the exploit part and let's just explore. This can be, you know, doing the force test can, can be a good option for you if you're looking for a very large sample size flowing through all your messages. Um, but if you're looking for, um, you know, a more efficient test that gets your results faster and cheaper, I recommend sticking to the single ad set um, approach. So as you can see here, don't, don't fear the iron, iron giant. Like it's, it's safe to assume that it's, it's running in your best interest. <laughs> Um, so, you know, this was an overview of how to do things uh, manually via Facebook. Um, I highly recommend everybody try this, this manual testing um, for at least one test. And it'll take about, you can budget like 60 to 90 minutes to run the test. Um, we, so, so, you know, our background with this and the reason why I have all this information is we specialize in actually testing this at scale for a lot of our clients. So we have a tool that does it programmatically. As I mentioned, there's, there's two approaches. Um, so for the manual testing, I highly recommend doing it if you're just doing a few tests. Um, there are teams that do it for more than a few tests, and it's just a question of how many um, team resources you have available to, to put into um, using it. Uh, it's free, besides the cost of the ads. Um, they have really, really customizable reports, which is great. Um, and you only have one platform to look at. So if you're going in and you're doing a mix of other ads too that aren't dark tests and you only want one place to go, you know, that, that's really good. Um, there's also a really large community of users. So there's you know, a lot of help documentation available too. Um, the programmatic approach um, it, that we take uses Facebook's ad API. You can also use the ad API. If you have the resources to do it, um, there are a lot of teams that do this internally. Um, I highly recommend checking out the Ad API um, documentation if that's something of interest. Like people will, will build it into their um, CMS, for example. Um, so definitely check it out. We have it set up simply because a lot of our clients were asking for it, and um, it helps them, you know, test at scale when they're doing lots and lots of tests. Um, so that's more or less the overview. I want to give you all a chance to ask questions, and there are some more advanced techniques we can talk about, too. Um, we, we do have a discount available as part of the partner program, um, so you all can check us out in your partner, <laughs> partner program um, uh, you know, dashboard. But uh, before going further, I wanted to see um, if you all have any questions about any of the pieces I covered so far. So we've seen performance really uh, at the highest and most consistent levels with the, the normal link posts. With one program? Yep. Yeah, okay. um, and uh, you know, one of the things you can do with the one photograph is you can bundle in, you, know, you can use tools like Canvas, for example, and you can bundle in a bunch of different images kind of as a collage. Um, Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It kind of goes back to the, you know, play around with it. Sometimes people will, will kind of lose the attention of their audience because they try and make the messaging um, uh, approachable to everybody. And so when you're trying to do everything to everybody, you engage no one. Um, so that's the same thing with like, if you have a cluttered photo with lots and lots of different visual points in there, like it's really good to go in and focus on things that have bold colors that show um, animate objects. So people and you know puppies and whatever it may be inanimate objects like uh, just images with text or um, uh, you know scenery or um, buildings logos those typically don't engage as well um, so it's better to have like human or puppies or something in the picture yes it's yeah people plus puppies is great you know Babies plus beautiful landscape, like the beautiful view out here, it's great. So it's just it, a lot of it is just a question of how are you telling your story. Um, the messaging and 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 the images kind of need to tie very well together. But yeah, people don't engage as well with inanimate things. Um, it, it doesn't relate as much to them for whatever reason. Yeah. So when I, I have a Facebook just their algorithm, you know, is always obviously changing. 
but I, I know that they've made a lot of changes to steer you know, uh, brands away from being too transactional mm -hmm. focused and their beliefs. So as an e-commerce business, if you're, I guess the question is, if you're doing a task to like really try to drive conversion and you're paying for it, it's treated as an ad, and it will definitely surface versus if you're doing that same content and you're not potentially promoting it as much to your core audience and can skew the results. So how do you look at that when you're trying to make those tests? Yeah, so the tests, um, you can run those, those extended tests that I mentioned. Um, and that's an easy way to like not bash your audience over the head with it too many times. There's only so many times you can post to your page about something, um, a sale, whatever it may be. Um, but we usually recommend taking the results of your test, you post it to your fans, and you'll get some organic engagement from there. Um, but using boosted posts, yeah, so the, the cool thing is with the testing, you now know that you're boosting the best version. So the benefits carry over to, to that as well. Um, so I guess the, you know, a, a common life cycle is you have some piece of content that goes live. Maybe it's already live. It's your you know, a, a product page. You take the URL. You run the test. It comes in 24 hours later. You then post that to your fans. You then boost that post to a level that kind of meets, meets your needs. Um, and then if you want to, you can have that concurrently running dark post on the side that's continuing to drive people in who aren't existing fans. Um, or you're always experimenting with you know, different audience segments that you haven't you know, uh, you know, played with as directly with your existing page fans. Um, so it's usually it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a shotgun approach. Um, and, and, and kind of, um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna hurt engagement though by doing these, these limited tests. And a follow-up question. So if you're using the lookalike, so you create your lookalike audience to your Facebook fan, it's automatically not going to show that ad to those your Facebook fans. It's only going to show it to the lookalike audience. Exactly. You need to exclude it. You don't need to exclude it. It will automatically that for you. Um, if you have, you know, where you can have differences there is, let's say somebody, you know, you've got a lookalike that's targeting people who. Um, uh, hit your, your pricing page or a product page and then a day later they became a fan of your page and if the Facebook if Facebook hasn't updated the lookalike audience because there's that three to seven day lag where they're kind of updating in that time frame there is a chance that person could be hit um, with with that sponsor post but it's yeah. pretty rare but just in general you're safe very safe it's, it, and it's uh, explicitly exclu excluded in the, in the code Did you say one that? Uh, in comparison between putting the call to action in yeah. the caption oh, yeah, and yeah. post image, which one do you think was better? Yeah, so when, when determining kind of where to put the call to action, whether the, in, the, in the image or, or in the title, so you can put it in a few places. You can have it layered over the image, as, as you suggested. You could have it in the headline below. And you can also have it the personal message at the top. Um, we usually recommend um, either having it in the message, the personal message at the top, or in the headline below. Um, what's interesting is, is people don't always realize that your post has a link behind it. So we've seen a lot of, of good performance by people who have the custom message at the top that has a short link. For example, um, it says, visit for our sale, visit to check out X. Um, up there at the top, they'll click that. Um, and it's duplicating the link that's embedded in the post too. But it's just like clear cut. You cannot miss the fact that there is something to click on. So that, we definitely recommend trying that. For the conversion pixel, so for e-commerce, okay, like it's easy. But when is not dealing with e-commerce? How do you suggest? For example, for us, we, have, uh, we are actually running ads, and we have created a conversion pixel on the recruitment page. Um, which, which, you know, place would you recommend to put the pixel? And could you share a little bit more about your your product or? Yeah, so we are doing a job. Uh -huh. So that's it's, it's, we we use the e-commerce experience for yeah. jobs. So uh, people come on the on the link page and they see the jobs of this company. Yeah. Then they can click to see apply. Yeah. And um, and then they can sign up to the job and then you know, 
So which should be the where should be the best place to so Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, so what do you count as a conversion? Is it a sign up? Is it a so whenever it says like thank you, is there a thank you for signing up page? Like right there that if you place it on that page then you know that they signed up. So if you place it on that page, just thank you for signing up page, then that counts as a conversion. But we want to know as well now uh, we want to do custom audience on the traffic we came before as well. So to so the traffic you came to the like branding page. Yeah. So, so when you're when you're so I guess um you know the question is where where does it make sense to to put the pixel and and to, you know base your audience off of um, uh, you know in this case for a, a job recommendation platform um, for that you know when you put the pixel on your site there, there's two pixels um, one of which Facebook's actually phasing out in the coming months but uh, the more general one is just a generic pixel that you can just put in your domain and it'll capture anything across your whole site. That gives you a lot of flexibility to create lots of different custom audiences. So I do that and I've got maybe like a dozen different custom audiences of people hitting all different parts of our site. Um, so for that, um, you know, as you were suggesting, maybe you have a distinct URL that's thanks for signing up. And that could be, you know, you can create a custom audience that just is that. You can create a custom audience that targets um, a bundle of URLs. So it's like, all right, people who, um, made it into the platform, people plus people who completed sign up plus X. So you can play around with that or you can have it very, very distinct. Um, it really comes down to the amount of traffic flowing through it. If you have under 100 people, unique people hitting certain things, like you're going to want to bundle because you're never going to get enough people to actually play with the targeting. So whatever you need to bundle up to get to 100, once you're at 100, then you can start playing with those more disparate groups. And you can kick off a test that targets those like five different groups, and then maybe try one that's the bundled audience as well. And you can see which one is actually converting best. Um, you know, the, the lookalike um, audience algorithm that Facebook has isn't perfect, especially if there's kind of uh, no clear cut trend among the underlying audience. So um, the more data that you can feed it where you think there will be a common connection and characteristics of people who are completing action X, that's, that's kind of where we recommend building an audience around. Um, I mean, you can do other things too, like if you have share buttons on your site, you can associate, you can create audiences off of people who are converting, you know, completing that action. So there's a lot of cool things you can do, but um, the mix and match approach works well, especially when you're working with a more limited uh, base set, maybe it's only a, a few hundred or a few thousand people. <laughs> so, um, one of the things we've been advised is to uh, target a specific segment. So, like, we are in the work and more space to target interior designers. Yep. And so, we are making a list of all the groups that those interior designers follow. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any email IDs of those interior designers that we can, like, upload. So, then, even, even if we are going with such targeted groups like interior designers and show our ads in specific pages, like Facebook group pages, that even then, do you think look alike? I mean, a combination of that would work. Yeah. So, so you can run. Um, you can actually run the the dark test on uh, a custom audience as opposed to a look alike. So, if you're not seeing high conversion on a look alike, you can say. So, the look alike is a big audience. So, it's like at a minimum 1.9 million people if you're targeting people in the U.S. Um, if you target a small audience, like a few hundred or a few thousand people who hit a page, you can do that. It'll just have fewer impressions, um, and it'll probably be more expensive to reach those people because there's fewer available, and you're, you know, it's more competitive to get those people. Um, with, you know, what you mentioned, I would recommend, you know, if you have some way of, of um, building a population of people, uh, maybe it is a landing page that your other ads have driven people to, and you're using the pixel to track which ones completed, got past some sort of of, of um, currency barrier. They gave you an email, they did whatever. You may not have their emails, uh, or you may not have something, and that's fine. As long as they complete some action on a property that you control, you can build a, you know, you need to run the unpublished post against people who explicitly completed that and just those folks, or a lookalike based off of them. That makes sense. So we're trying to do something like that. I want to walk that experiment and get your insights after the class. That's Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> we
we have an app, and let's say we have, you know, 30,000 emails from app signups, and we want to drive more app installs through a mobile yeah. app install ad. And would you say, like, let's say, you know, you just know there's a wide variety of different users on your app, but with the 30,000 emails you have, would you suggest trying to do a look-alike look audience based on the 30,000, or is that too big of a pool that should you run, you know, kind of try and see if you can find similarities, whether, you know, they're in school or maybe male versus female or yeah. something of the sort to sort by before doing a look-alike audience? Or, because I know usually it's the more emails you have, the better, but what is too much? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of, of when you have lots of data to work with, yeah. um, should you pare it down before building a lookalike off, of, right. off of it, in this case for, for app installs? Um, I guess it depends, you know, going back to, to what I mentioned where you want to build a lookalike off of um, a group of people who, who share lots of common characteristics as far as you can guess. Yes, um, so if you have like four segments of users, if you have basic demographics on them, maybe you want to split up that, that 30,000 into you know, four separate groups of people who, who fit those, you know, fit different personas. Yeah. Um, so keeping those personas in mind, and then you can actually create a custom audience based off of uploading their emails. Um, email matching, is, is it a consumer focused app? Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the hit rate on that's gonna be higher. If, it's, if you're like a, uh, a B2B company right. of emails, right. people's work emails are commonly not their Facebook emails, yeah. but what you have probably aligned very well um, so I definitely recommend going in and segmenting them okay. if you know that they're distinct segments um, right. or, or turn, you know, personas. Um, otherwise, you can just kind of upload them um, all together. But I think you'll see better results if you do a, even a little bit of segmenting. Okay. Um, the lookalike audience that Facebook does is not um, does not focus on specific genders or geographies. So that's a, a good thing to keep in mind is that if you know that... Um, only women or only men are interested in what you're doing. Um, a lookalike may target people who are across those genders, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing um, for for most companies, unless it's specifically like you know, uh, you know picking an exclusive gender product. Um, but that is something to keep in mind, and that's where you can maybe go in and use a save audience instead, rather than a, a uh, lookalike. If you're gonna use a saved audience, just be careful to not have it too specific, because if your audience is too specific, it'll be too small, it'll be like 500 people. And if it's only 500 people, the costs go up, you're not gonna really based see. Based on the CRM list? Um, well, it could be based on the CRM list, or you could go into the audience creator within um, Power Other. And you can say, I'm only looking for you know, <laughs> women in these age ranges in this particular locale. And you can do that, but you know, I would try to make sure your audience is at least a few hundred thousand people if you're going to go the saved audience approach as opposed to a lookalike. Um, uh, but again, that's, it's kind of um, more of an edge case. Okay. But, but yeah, segmenting based on personas works great. Okay. Hi. Um, so when you're running these sample tests, um, should the post be essentially the same kind of thing? Like for instance, like clicks to your homepage versus an ebook download versus a lead gen. Should it all just be one objective with nine ad sets with different images and text? Or should you kind of mix and match different types of, I guess, CTAs? So um, you would probably want to run, so you're gonna, each, each test is gonna have a specific URL associated with it. Um, and the creatives will align with that particular thing. So, you know, as with other ads, if somebody clicks on something in the ad and it doesn't align with what they ultimately see, you're going to have higher bounce rates, less conversion. Um, so, it's just making sure that the creatives align with that. So, you can go in and you know try nine creatives for for one particular um, URL, and then have a separate test for a different URL. Alternately, you can go in. Take that test with that specific objective and clone it a bunch of times and set a different audience each time. Because maybe 
the objective and the creatives are clear to you, but you're not sure which audience is going to resonate most with, or which one's going to get you, you know, get folks in at the lowest cost. So that's where you kind of play around with those that clone tool you have available. Right, and, and one more follow-up. So when you're creating the custom audience based on the traffic coming into your site, uh, does that take like a few days for Facebook to kind of pick that up, or does it just happen right away? It depends on your on your traffic. Um, so you know, when you're at the I've got five thousand people a month, you know, are unique setting my site. It may take a few days to get. Um, enough stuff showing up. You will see it in your um, audience dashboard. It'll actually show, um, you know, once you've created and installed the pixel, it'll start populating. It'll look like the Google Analytics dashboard just in terms of, you know, how many how many folks it's detecting coming in. Uh, so you'll know, um, in you know, in that spot, uh, you know, how well things are going. Cool. Any other questions? Um, so you mentioned like how you recommend mostly mobile versus desktop in most of the ads. So like for an e-commerce business that let's say you know maybe you know you're going on your phone and you're seeing let's say it's a carousel ad or something and oh these shoes look awesome I'm gonna click it and I'm gonna check it out but I'm not necessarily gonna buy from my mobile as in I'm more like browsing from the mobile experience. So would you recommend like for those e-commerce platforms to do strictly, I mean mobile maybe as an awareness play, but then I don't know if you could retarget those visitors on desktop to actually purchase? Because I feel like more purchases kind of happen on desktop than mobile. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, it's, I think it largely depends on what your mobile experience is for your end destination. Um, also, it's a question of whether or not using the buy now option yeah. on, on Facebook. For, for most folks, their uh, mobile experience is not yet at a point where it's it's like dead simple, click, right. buy, done. So that's, yeah, people do tend to go to desktop for some of those. So if that's, if that's the case, um, then you can go in and specify desktop only. Yeah. And just be aware it may take a little bit longer for it to run, um, and cost might be slightly higher. Um, that changes over time, but, um, and if you're also running desktop, um, Exclusively, you may want to put in more information in the description field, which will now yeah. be visible. Um, one thing that's important to make sure: don't let like you're going to have to go in and make sure the placement is exclusively desktop and mobile. Otherwise, Facebook's going to put it on its extended ad network and its display ad on the right, which you don't want to do for dark tests. Um, your goal here is to figure out what's going to work when it goes out on your um, Facebook page. So, so make sure you, you narrow it down um, to just you know, desktop and mobile, or exclusively desktop in the event that you don't have the, the mobile experience folks will convert on. Um, do you have any experience with the CPCs of like using videos in your posts versus images? I, I know like when we tried it, it was a little bit lower when we did video, but I don't know if we just got lucky, or because I know they put a big emphasis on video now. Yeah, so the, the video, that's a great question. So it's a question of, are CPCs lower when you're doing you know, a, a video post versus a link post um, or other types? Um, video was like this momentous movement, everybody getting into video. Um, and a lot of people built uh, you know, some short-term experiments around, can I justify you know, focusing on, on video, which may not drive as many people to my site, because the video is hosted there, it's not going to drive it back to my site. Um, can I justify doing that? Because I guess the bet is I'm going to get more shares, so I'm going to be seeing by more people, I'm going to grow more on my Facebook page, more people are going to like my page. Um, with everybody moving into videos, videos didn't perform as well over time for everybody as they once did. Videos still perform really, really well for a lot of folks, especially if you're looking for a lot of post engagement. Um, in terms of uh, clicks to website, uh, it is no longer working as well for a lot of folks as it once did. Um, that's where I recommend continuing to test with that. Um, but I would go between uh, clicks to website and, and, and the video post itself. One thing you can do um, that we've seen work well is you can put an image in that has the little play button on it. So people click it, 
they, you know, and they get that you know video anticipation. Sneaky. <laughs> and they go back to your site, and that, that's pretty easy to, to plop in for all of your images. Um, and what's cool with that is it makes it easier to play around with uh, what image will show up in the video screen, the, the video screen. <laughs> Um, so you can play around with like, right, well, how would the video best be starting off if I wanted to drive the most engagement. And you can even modify your video later on, simply because it's like, oh, this is still at the front. People like that part the most. Right. Don't the videos like autoplay, or like, do they stop doing that? Because I feel like it's like back and forth sometimes. Um, they, so autoplay um, still happens, yeah. but audio won't necessarily happen. Right, right. Um, they're constantly experimenting with things, so yeah. even so that's my experience. Maybe I'm part of their experiment group on Facebook. Don't and you have I don't to know. be on Wi-Fi for it to be out of play? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe that's an instance where you want, you've got a video and you want to, you know, mobile, you expect people are going to drop off because they're either not on Wi-Fi or they're not going to, you know, want to have video streaming on their phone. So that's an option as well where you might want to target desktop for that. Well, uh, yeah, have it help. Um, and if you all have any other questions, my email is at the end of the presentation. So feel free to reach out. Um, I find this a lot of fun, so I'm always talking with folks about different tactics they can take. Um, and you know, things evolve pretty quickly. So what works today, videos may not work in two weeks, and then it may change around again two weeks after that. So um, yeah, I guess always be testing. <laughs>